thank you everyone for coming to Constitution Day uh, 2016. We're very lucky today to have Dr. Marvin Overby, a professor of political science and a member of the board of directors of the Kinder Institute on Constitutional, Constitutional Democracy uh, from the University of Missouri. Dr. Overby holds a PhD from the University of Oklahoma where he was a fellow at the Carl Albert Congressional Research and Studies Center. He was previously a member of the faculty of the University of Mississippi and at Loyola University Chicago. He has served as the Frederick Middlebush Chair of Politics at the University of Missouri, as the Fei Yi Ning Visiting Professor at the Johns Hopkins University Nanjing University Center for Chinese and American Studies, and as the Laszlo Orzov Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer at the University of Szeged in Hungary. He's the author of numerous articles in American politics and specializes in Congress, state legislative organizations, uh, minority politics and campaign advertising. Today he's here to speak about the Great Migration and the making of a modern America. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marvin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to use the microphone if you can hear me out there. I've been doing this for a long time. I can project my voice, I think. I hope well enough for everyone in, in, the, in the building to hear. Um, first, let me thank you for the invitation to come down here. I used to come down to Myrtle Beach when I was a kid. Uh, it's great to come back 35 years later and see that the, the part of this part of the world is still as beautiful as it was then. Um, let me also say that I looked through my entire wardrobe find, trying to find something teal to wear uh, this weekend. Uh, I had to just go with the, with the uh, color on the, on the PowerPoint slides. Um, let me also say that I appreciate your being here. I know there's another speaker on campus tonight who's considerably more famous than I am. I will try to make up with insights what I lack in celebrity status, right, and, and send you away from here a little bit smarter uh, on at least a couple of items that I have to pass along. And let me finally thank the late Senator Robert Byrd. You, might, you may or may not know that Constitution Day was his idea. Uh, he pushed it through the Senate right before his, uh, his retirement and death. It's been a great boon to political science professors like myself. We get to travel around the country and talk about the Constitution. So I thank, Professor, uh, for, I thank Senator Byrd. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about a, a project that I've been working on, or my girlfriend would probably tell you if she was here, a project I haven't been working on hard enough for the last couple of years, which is a book-length manuscript on the Great Migration. And I think it is probably, it may be the uh, least understood and least appreciated uh, development in American politics in the 20th century. And I hope to give you a sense uh, at the end of today that it is, in fact, one of the things that made modern America. And it has significant implications for, for politics and society and even the Constitution that we, that we appreciate today. Right, so if you're ready to go... I'll begin by noticing that human beings are a migratory species, right? There have been a lot of great little g migrations, and there's just a list of them, right? The migrations of humans, homo sapiens, out of Africa 100,000 years ago. The, the crossing of the Bering Strait, the Bering Land Bridge to Asia into the Americas 23,000 years ago. The barbarian invasion of Europe uh, 400, in between 418, 418 years in the Common Era when, when groups like the Majars came into, came into Western Europe. The so-called Great Migration to, to New England of the Pilgrims and the Puritans between 1620 and 1640. The Great Mormon Migration, right, one of the biggest religious migrations ever of Mormons out of places like Missouri, right, to the, to the Great Salt Lake Valley in Utah. The transatlantic migrations of the 19th and 20th centuries of, of, of wave after wave of first northern Europeans and then southern Europeans coming in to the United States. The Greek-Turkish population exchange of 1923, one you're probably not as familiar with, but one of the direct results of, of the Great War, of World War I, when Turkey and Greece switched populations over contested areas. And the partition of India in 1947. Those are all great migrations. But when students of American politics talk about the great migration, and they make their voice tremble like that, the great migration, they are talking about the great migration of Southerners northward in the 20th century. Right? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Again, I think it has huge and oftentimes underappreciated implications for 
for how our society and our politics are organized today. Um, it occurs in, and different scholars will give you different dates from this, but it occurs roughly in the first half of the 20th century. And it is part of a larger ebb and flow of Southerners around the United States. So partially, right, there was, an, there was a pre-Civil War, an antebellum flow of Southerners, especially Southern black slaves from the northeastern part of the South, my home state of Virginia, into what's called the Old Southwest, places like Mississippi and, and Alabama and Louisiana. And then there's going to be a reverse migration in the later 20th century, as you're going to see some of those African Americans and, and, and white Southerners who move north begin to come back south. So the Great Migration period, I want to talk about this movement in the, in the first half of the 20th century, should also be seen as part of a larger migration of Southerners around the South and sometimes back into the South. My focus in the talk I'm giving today and, and the book I'm, I'm supposed to be writing is on the two waves and the three causes and the many consequences of the Great Migration. Now, there have been some works published in the last couple of years on the Great Migration. There's a nice book that came out uh, four or five years ago by Isabel Wilkerson called the great title, The Warmth of Other Suns. You might have, might have seen it or read it at some point. And there's a very good book by Timothy Lehman called The Promised Land. These are both very good historical treatments of the Great Migration. But they tend very much to focus on social history. They will tell you these great stories of, of families and what they went through during the Great Migration. But I think by focusing on that fine grain detail, telling these great human interest stories, they miss some of the causes and the consequences that I'm going I'm, I'm to focus on in my talk tonight. Some background. All right. I'm a professor. I, I can't just talk about a topic. I've got to give you the context and the background of it. All right. Probably weigh the hell too much of it. So at some point, if I'm giving you too much, wave your hands and say, get to the point. Right? But I, hope, I think you'll find some of this background, some of this context pretty interesting as well. The South, and I don't think I'm saying, it, who, who, who here is a Southerner? Everybody here? Many immigrants? Right? I don't think I'm being terribly parochial when I say that the South, I think, has always been at the center of national debates about what we are as a country and who we are as a people. That is not just a, a great migration 20th century phenomenon, right? It's not just a Bill Clinton phenomenon. This is something that has, has been at the heart of our debates as a people since before the founding. And we can just think about some of those, some of those issues that have been involved in this trying to figure out where the South fits into the rest of the country. So slavery, the whole issue of tariffs, right? Um, the, the Hamilton musical, right, is, is uh, the biggest thing on Broadway right now. And the Hamiltonian tariffs really spurred the development of the Northeast, the industrialization of the Northeast, really hurt the South. That sows the seeds for the Civil War in many ways. Yeah, the Civil War itself and westward expansion. What are we going to do with a society where part, the southern tier has a slave labor system, the northern tier has a free labor system? How is that going to work as you spread westward from the original 13 co colonies? And that, as you know, is going to trigger the Civil War. The Civil War is going to be followed by a period we know as Reconstruction. Um, failed, I think, in many regards, and we're going to talk a bit about that today and why it failed, and then the so-called redemption, where the white southern power structure that had led the South into the Civil War to protect cotton and to protect slavery, they are going to redeem the southern states one by one, bringing them back under the rule of southerners out from under military control by the nation. The, then the so-called second reconstruction, the civil rights era of the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s, and then what's sometimes called the second redemption, the, the reaction to the civil rights movement. Um, and we could, we could talk about more of those things in Q&A at the end if you'd like. But the Great Migration fits into this historical story, I think, 
in which national politics really is centered around, in many ways, southern regional politics. I think it is very, very difficult to understand the United States if you don't understand the South. But I also think the obverse of that is true. That if you're going to understand the South, you have to understand the fact that it exists within a bigger, stronger, more powerful, more authoritative national political structure. And the Great Migration is going to have a lot to do with both the South and the North, and in terms of making us more one country, I think. That's the argument I'm going to make anyway. We'll see how, we'll see how effective I am at the end of the talk. The Old South. I promise you I'm not going to play the piano. I'm just going to put my water bottle there. The Old South. For most of American history, the South and the North were literally separated. And both Southern politics and Southern economics occurred behind what's sometimes called the Magnolia Curtain. Right? You can think about it as being this line that stretches essentially an extension of the Mason-Dixon line from the northern border of Maryland across into places like Missouri and the like. You have different economics south of that Magnolia Curtain then you have north of that Magnolia Curve. And that is going to set the stage for the Great Migration. We need to remember, in case you don't know, right, that 18th and 19th century migration in the United States was almost entirely east to west. There was very little movement in the 18th and 19th century north to south. And the reasons for that have, are partially related to agriculture, right, partially related to agriculture. Um, I'm a big fan of etymology, right? And you guys know etymology is not the study of insects, that's entomology. Etymology is the study of words and words history, right? It turns out the word south comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, sooth. Any idea what sooth means in old Anglo-Saxon? Any, any linguistic historians in the room tonight? What does the word sooth mean? What would you guess? No. Sun. It's the word for sun. What that implies is that the South is a place where there, that's why those of you who have moved here to retire, it's a place with more sunshine. Right? Now, folks, that has implications for agriculture. A lot of the migration in the 18th and 19th century was east to west because it was agricultural migration. And you started out growing a, a crop in South Carolina. And many of those same crops you could grow in South Carolina, you could also grow in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. Right? You did not learn how to grow a crop in South Carolina that you could grow in North Dakota. Similarly, if you're in New England, you learn how to grow crops that grow at that latitudinal band. But you do not learn in New England how to grow cotton, or indigo, or rice, or, or pick your southern crop. Right? So as the American population in the original 13 colonies starts spreading west, they tend to do so in those latitudinal bands with northerners moving from the northeast into the central north, into the northwest, southerners moving from the southeast into the old southwest and the southwest. Right? It's, it's east to west migration for those agricultural reasons. But that is going to, again, keep this this two-tiered system, right? You've got the South, you've got the North, not much migration between them in the 18th and 19th centuries. The other reason for this huge divide, right, between the North and the South is economic. And this is a point that, that I, I've, I was beaten into my head by a, one of the great Southern economic historians, Gavin Wright, at Stanford University that there are simply different labor markets north and south of the Mason-Dixon line. And those different labor markets are going to make it very difficult for people in the south to move north into the northern labor market and people in the north to move south into the southern labor market. That as long as you have separate labor markets, you're not going to get north to south migration. And that is, both, that is true both before and after the Civil War. Right? It's based upon slavery but it extends much later 
than the slave era. So the Old South is an isolated region, not much migration north to south, both for agricultural and economic reasons. To understand this a bit further, we need to understand that in the antebellum period, and, the, and again, just like when Southerners talk about the Great Migration, they're talking about the Great Migration of Southerners North. When Southerners talk about the war, we're still talking about the Civil War, right? So when I say antebellum, I'm talking not about before the war against Iraq. I'm talking about the Civil War. In the years before the Civil War, slavery in the South capitalized the cost of labor. Do you know what that means? What does it mean to say that you capitalize the cost of something? It becomes an asset. It becomes an asset. What else? Took advantage. That's another, it's another, another definition of capitalize. You capitalize on something. That's not what economists mean when they say capitalize. Right? How was how slave, slavery different from free labor? So slavery is cheap, right? Slavery is cheap labor. Every semester I teach a class on Southern politics, I have my students write that down, right? Write down, slavery is cheap labor. And then I say, erase it, right? Because that is absolutely, fundamentally, inexorably wrong, right? And this, again, this is one thing I want you to learn and walk away. If nothing else, right, this is a fact that will somewhat change your vision of America, I think. Slavery is actually very expensive labor. Because slavery is capitalized labor. That means that, at least in the short run, labor costs don't vary with slavery. Right? Labor costs stay the same. You, you don't fire a slave. So labor costs remain the same, and that tends to drive up the cost of labor, as opposed to wage labor, which tends to drive down the cost of labor. Does that make sense to everybody? We can go into more detail on this about why it's so. One of the things slavery does is that slavery is going to discourage immigration from other countries. Right? So you see very little immigration into the South compared to what you get in the North in the 19th century. Because slavery has driven up the price of labor, slave owners do not want to bring in cheap labor to undermine the value of their capitalized asset. Right? So ma'am, you said cheap labor, right? Do you see why it's not cheap labor? OK, we can talk more about that later. <laughs> what that means, and again, people don't want to believe this, but it's just an historical reality. Before the Civil War, wages were higher in the South than they were in the North. In fact, sometimes twice as high. Now, here when we say wages, one, one thing you need to keep in mind is sometimes these wages were actually being taken by the owners of the slave. right? So a slave owner would rent a slave out to work but would get for that slave a very high wage in return. Right? In the North, wages were low. Right? Wages were lower because the North was going through an, an, indu an early industrialization process, low value added manufacturing, like you get in Vietnam or China today. And what are wages like in Vietnam or China or Mexico? They're low. right? The South was getting high wages in part because they were producing cotton, right? And cotton was a very right, cotton was a very important commodity. We're going to talk more about cotton a bit later. But one of the reasons why the South focused on cotton was not just Eli Whitney's cotton gin, but because the United States was the only place in the world producing long staple cotton. This was before Egypt. This was before other places started producing cotton. So if you wanted cotton, the United States was the place to get it. And one of the reasons that, 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 that slavery um, develops as it does in the South, and one of the reasons cotton develops as it does in the South, is because the cost of labor is so expensive in the South, cotton was the only thing that made a profit. Right? And if you have high labor costs, like you do under slavery, You've got, to, you've got to put your labor to work on, on, the, on the product that's going to bring the highest return. And so you have stories in the South, pre-Civil War South, of landowners who knew they had gold on their property and wouldn't mine it because cotton was literally 
much, much more valuable. And so they wouldn't use their slave labor to mine for gold, they would use it to grow cotton. Right? We'll come back to that, because cotton is, is key to the story. In the post-Civil War period, after the war ends, you see a flip, right? partially because of historical circumstances, partly because of what happens in terms of the Civil War. But post-bellum, the people who had been labor lords, the slave owners, they become then landlords. Right? And what they, at that point, they now have to hire their former slaves to work for them. So what you have after the Civil War is that wages decline in the South. So after the Civil War, we get the, we get the pattern we're more used to. Higher wages in the North, lower wages in the South. Right? In part, that's because over the course of the Civil War, Northern manufacturing has gotten much better. Right? It's, it's sort of an underappreciated fact, I think, about the Civil War, that it's the first modern war. It's the first war in which you see um, uniform sizes for clothing, at least for male clothing. Right? Women's sizes still make no sense, right? But men's clothing sizes make sense, and they become uniform only due to the manufacture of uniforms in the Civil War. Right? So you begin to see this huge advances in industrialization in the North that comes in part with standardization. Standard sizes of nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts become standard of a war. Rail gauges, right? How far apart your, the, the, the tracks on your, on your rail line are. Before the Civil War, there were six or seven of those. <clears throat> to, to win the Civil War, Lincoln has to coordinate the Northern economy to be able to deliver the resources of the Northern economy to beat the South. And you can't do that if you've got to stop your train every 100 miles or so and change, change tracks. So the North begins to standardize rail lines, rail gauges during that period. Right? And that's going to mean that you are going to get more, the Northern economy is, is maturing and it's beginning to produce more high value items. And that means wages are going to go up in the North just as they're going down in the South. Make sense to everybody? Okay. Reconstruction, I said earlier it was, it was failed. And I think it was in many ways doomed to failure, right? Because Reconstruction was in many ways designed to keep former slaves on the land and back to producing cotton, right? In a very real way, cotton was considered to be a slave crop. And recently emancipated African Americans, they didn't want to grow cotton, right? That was a crop of slavery. They much preferred to grow things like well, things they could eat. They much preferred to grow vegetables and fruits and, and things you could eat. But the problem with that was, from a national perspective, those were not exportable goods. The exportable good was cotton. And in fact, until 1937, again, this is a fact that many Americans have a hard time believing, until 1937, cotton was America's biggest export. And the United States government, at the end of the Civil War, had a real incentive to get cotton production back up to where it had been. Cotton production in the Civil War had fallen by 85%. That meant, essentially, that American exports had fallen by something like 85%. And what happens when your exports fall? You have to borrow money, especially to to de deal with your currency issue, right? You guys know what specie currency is? The term we don't hear much anymore because America went off specie currency in the 1970s. No, well, related to it. Specie currency is currency that is matched dollar for dollar by gold reserves, right? During the Civil War, America had to go off specie currency because they had to borrow, the, the national government had to borrow a lot of money to, 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 and, and, and print a lot of money to finance the Civil War. To get back to species currency, right, to make, to make your currency solid again, thought you had to go back to basing it upon gold. The way you can buy gold is only by exporting other goods. And so the United States government had a real incentive to get cotton production back up to tie 
African American labor back to the land to keep them producing cotton in the South so that America would have something to export. Right. Is that clear to everybody? I'm covering in, in an hour today some, what I sometimes take a semester to go over. So if I'm rushing this a little bit, stop me and I'll, I'll, I'll try to unpack it a little bit more. Yeah, they need to permit U.S. to return to species currency. So, you get in the post-Civil War era lower wages in the South than in the North, and you get a Northern industrial complex that is relying on European immigrants. Right? I said earlier there were not many European immigrants into the South during the 1800s, and that, that, that's just true. And in part that's because immigration waves tend to follow wave upon wave. In other words, the second wave follows the first wave. The third wave follows the second wave. And in the north, those waves kept getting bigger. But the south was largely cut off and cut out of that European immigration in the, in the, in the 19th century and even in the early 20th century because there had been no first wave of Italians moving into Savannah. There had been no first wave of Greeks moving into New Orleans, right? You didn't see that first wave coming in, so you didn't see the larger subsequent waves. Immigrants from Europe tended to go into the north, and they were filling those jobs in the north in the industrializing northeastern factories. Politically, after Reconstruction, you see something interesting as well. Again, we're going to deal with some broad generalities here, but they are generalities that have a good deal of, of intellectual interest to them, I think. First and foremost, right, after Reconstruction ends in the so-called Compromise of 1877 that Southern African Americans reasonably called the Great Betrayal, right, when the North ends Reconstruction uh, to, to solve the 1876 presidential election of Hayes versus Tilden, at that point, the Republican Party just quits caring about the South. Right? Just quits caring. So the Republican Party did not need the South to be able to run, to run the country. Bless you. Sorry. That's all right. I have some Claritin with me, I think, if you need it. I need it. Um, keep in mind, between 1860 and 1932, 70 year period, only two Democrats are elected president. Right? Who are they? Cleveland. Grover Cleveland and Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, but between 1860 and 1932, Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, as he was called when he went to my undergraduate alma mater, Davidson College, for a year. He was known as Tommy Wilson. The Davidson people will tell you he couldn't hack Davidson, so he had to move north to Princeton, right? Davidson was too tough for him. I don't know. Two Democratic presidents during that time period. The Republicans do not need the South to win the presidency or to control the nation. In fact, Republicans follow what has been called the Lincoln strategy. In the 1860 election, Abraham Lincoln, the Republican nominee for president, appears on exactly one Southern ballot. Only the state of Virginia is his name even on the ballot. Right. The Lincoln strategy is after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, until the 1950s, you do not even see Republican candidates coming down to the South at all. Right. They write the South off. They don't need it. They can ignore the South and what's going on in the South. Right. The National Democratic leaders, on the other hand, they have to have the South. They have to have the South. It is the only regional basis the party has. Right? We need to keep in mind that at this time period we're talking about, Massachusetts, that's the People's Republic of Massachusetts. Right? I don't even get a chuckle out of that. The People's Republic of Taxachusetts, right? the most liberal state arguably now in the Union, was the most Republican state back in the day. Democrats were not drawing votes in Massachusetts. They, the only votes they could consistently count on year in and year out were Southern votes. And that was particularly important because of something known as the two-thirds veto. Right? This is the second thing I'm going to teach you today. Right? One is that slavery is expensive labor. This is number two. What's the two-thirds veto? Yeah. 
I don't get paid any extra for this, right? This is free learning for you, right? It's not about the great migration. This is free. What's the two-thirds veto? Two-thirds to overturn of... No. How do, why is Hillary Clinton the nominee for the Democratic Party this year? Don't give me a smart-ass answer either, right? <laughs> why is Donald Trump the nominee of the Republican Party? Because he got a... Because he got a majority of the, of the, of the votes at the, Demo at the Republican National Convention for Trump, and, and Hillary got a majority of the Democratic delegates at the Democratic National Convention. Back in the day, that wouldn't have gotten you the nomination, right? From 1832, the first Democratic nominating convention, until 1936, to get the Democratic nomination, you had to have two-thirds of the convention delegates back you. Right? You didn't know this, did you? Hey, and there's new knowledge, right? You had to have two-thirds support. What that meant was that the South, sitting there with roughly a third of the, of the delegates at the Democratic convention, the South could block any Democrat who threatened the civil rights agenda in the South. Right? So Republicans didn't give a damn about the South. And Democrats could not nominate anybody for president who did care about the civil rights situation in the South. Because that person would have been vetoed by a unified Southern delegation at the convention. Right? So I'm setting, I promise I'm going to tie this all together. I'm, I'm going to try. So don't yawn at me, right? I'm going to try to tie this all together. This all is going to feed into why the Great Migration is important. Right? Questions about that? A little bit of scope first. I'm take, take a little breather here. Not, not give you any sort of intellectual arguments. Just talk a little bit about the scope of the Great Migration. Uh, again, depending upon the time period, and different scholars have different measures of it, but roughly between 1900 and 1970, 20 plus million Southerners, black and white, move out of the 11 states of the old Confederacy and move to other parts of the United States. For Southern whites, they tend to come from Appalachia, and they tend to come from the Dust Bowl, Texas, places like that. Many of them head west. Right? For African Americans, they are going to be moving out of the heavily black belt areas of the South. Right? And if you know anything about sort of Southern history, that word black belt refers to the quality of the soil. Right? It's so rich that it's literally black. Right? It does not refer to the, to, 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 the, to the skin color of the people who live there. It refers to the rich the rich soil in places like the Mississippi Delta and, the, and in you know, low country South Carolina and other places. And many of these African Americans, former slaves, sons and daughters, grandsons and daughters of former slaves during the Great Migration, they're going to be heading north. And that figure there at the bottom is striking, I think, to me. In 1910, in the 1910 census, 89% of all African Americans lived in the South, by 1970, that number had fallen 40, 45 points, right? 55 percent. So you, it's, a, it's a big migration of people out of the South and into other parts of the country. For those of you who are visual learners, right, I'll give you some visualizations of this. That's more or less a map of the Great Migration, showing how, how, how people moved out of places like Mississippi into Chicago out of places like South Carolina and to Washington and Baltimore and Philly and New, and New York and the like. But keep in mind, this is the first time in American history you're seeing significant north to south or south to north migration, no longer east to west. It's a pretty busy little graph there. But it shows you southern black population by state of the 11 states of the old Confederacy. So you see, for instance, this top line here. This is Mississippi. The black population in Mississippi falls from over 55% to under 40%. Again, just some visualizations. I'm not going to quiz you on this, right? And there'll be no test on it later, so you don't have to memorize any of this. There's an easier one to see, a sub-regional uh, sub population, southern black population, right? In the deep south states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, in 1900, 50% of that regional subpopulation was African American. 
and that falls to 30% by 1970. In the rim south, right, Virginia, my home state, North Carolina, Tennessee, and the like, you fall from just over 30% in 1900 to uh, about 18% in 1970, right? So southern population is becoming less African American, becoming whiter, and northern population is also getting more African American. These are the black, popu black population in the selected northern states, right? The top line there is Illinois, which goes from less than 2% African American in 1900 to 13% African American by 1970. And you see other selected states in there as well. New York is going to be 12% African American from almost nothing in 1900, right? So significant movement of black population out of the south and into the north. And there again, you see some figures for selected northern cities. Um, New York goes from you know, very, very few African Americans in 1900 to well over 160,000 by 1970. Right? Significant population shifts. And you see that in all of those cities, Detroit, Chicago, and Philadelphia as well. Now, a little shift in gears here. What causes this? Right? Why do we get the Great Migration when we do in the first part of the 20th century? And I'm going to argue there are three causes. I learned a long time ago that if you, told, if you numbered things for students, they take much better notes and remember them. So I'm, I'm going to number these for you. Right? Reason number one, cause number one, is World War I, right? the Great War, the war to end all wars. What happens during World War I on an international perspective is that the populations of almost every country in Europe get mobilized to defend the fatherland, right? British get mobilized, French get mobilized, Germans get mobilized, Austrians get mobilized, Italians get mobilized, Greeks get mobilized, right? Poles get mobilized, Russians get mobilized. The mobilization of that population, of the people who are most likely to immigrate, younger people, the mobilization of that, of that cohort for you know, the bloody years of the, of, the, of the First World War, that means that millions of otherwise eligible immigrants into the United States who would have gone to Boston and New York and Philadelphia to work in American factory jobs, they're no longer available because they're fighting and dying for the king or the emperor or the czar or whoever. Right? You also get U-boat warfare in the North Atlantic that essentially severs most domestic, I'm sorry, most um, non-military traffic across the Atlantic. So even if those soldiers hadn't been mobilized to fight for the Tsar, they still could not have made it over to the United States because they, 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 were, they were too fearful of being torpedoed and ending up at the bottom of the North Atlantic. You are, so North Atlantic, that, 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 that stream of Europeans coming from Europe that had been so big, and we'll talk about numbers here in just a minute, had been so big, is going to get squeezed off during World War I. And the factories in, in, in America, which is going to, you know, going to be the, the arsenal of democracy, they can't get the workers they're used to getting. Right? And that's going to continue really after World War II, as, I'm sorry, after World War I as well, when the United States is going to become increasingly afraid of, <coughs> sounds familiar, right, of welcoming immigrants in, because at that point there was a fear that these immigrants would be Reds, right, that they would have been, they would have been tainted by the, by, by the socialist Bolshevik revolution in the Soviet Union, and that they would be dangerous to American interests. So even after World War I ends, that, that flow of immigrants from Europe in has been severely attenuated. There are some numbers. 1910, over a million immigrants come into the United States from Europe. By 1915, that number is cut in a third, and it never really rebounds in the 20s, right? So even by 1920, two years after the war is, is over, after we've gone over there, kicked a little ass, settled that dispute, right? They're taping this. I should, probably shouldn't curse, should I? Uh, no, let's see. After World War I has ended, you still don't see immigration levels returning to pre-World War I levels, even during the Roaring Twenties, right, when business was going gangbusters. Even during the Roaring Twenties, you see roughly a, somewhere between a half or less than a half to a third of the immigration from Europe you'd seen in, in just a decade before, a decade and a half before. Right? So you get the point. 
European immigration is cut off during World War I. The importance of that for the Great Migration is that for the first time ever, northern factories have to find another source of labor. And what's the source of labor they turn to? Well, they turn to the South. There is in the South at this period an, a pool of excess labor. Right? Southern, 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 southern labor is underutilized. So there are people who are ready and willing to move to better jobs. And for the first time ever in World War I, northern factories are going to start pulling those people north. And this is going to be the first wave of the Great Migration, is what happens during, during and after World War I. Now, like any first wave of a migration, the people who go first tend to be the most mobile. Right? They tend to be the people who can go easiest. Who can go easiest? The answer is even right there on the board. Right? Young, single men. Why? Why can they go easiest? They don't have any ties. There are fewer ties, right? They're, they're the ones who can go most easily without upsetting sort of anybody else around them, right? They are the most mobile group in society. And they are the ones who go in this first wave of the Great Migration. That is important because what the first wave of the Great Migration does not do is upset the South's sharecropping and tenancy system. Right? Now, a little digression here. When the Civil War ends, right, you've got, this, you've got this huge social and economic disturbance. Right? It is estimated that white Southerners lost a greater percentage of their wealth in the Civil War than any defeated people in world history in any war. Right? The Japanese in World War II come in a distant second. Right? The, the whole basis of the Southern economy, which had been based upon slavery, is turned on its head. Right? One of the things that then becomes a problem, an issue, is how do you tie labor to the land? And any, if anyone here has, was raised on a farm family, raised on a farm, what you know is that, that labor demands on a farm are seasonal. Right? There's not always work to be done on a farm. There, it's going to be highly seasonal depending on whether you're talking about the the planting season or the picking season. But there was a real fear after the Civil War that without the coercion of slavery, you wouldn't have labor available necessary when the crop came due. Right? Cotton is especially a crop you've got to pick at the right time. You've got to have the labor there when that bowl is ready to pick. Otherwise, it's going to spoil on you very quickly, and, 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 that, and that white gold is going to turn into dust for you. Right? So. The tenancy and, and sharecropping system was developed after the Civil War as a way, in the absence of slavery, to tie labor to the land. How do you make sure you've got people around to pick the crop when it comes in? Well, you, you, you operate on a sharecropping or tenancy system. Are you, are, are, is that almost everyone here familiar with the concept of sharecropping? Right? That the landowner owned the land, oftentimes owned the house, the mule, the the plow, he owned, he extended credit to his, to his croppers and tenants. And the croppers and tenants provided the labor. And in exchange for their labor, they would get some percentage of the crop when it came in, and the landowner would get, would get the rest. But you can see how that ties labor to the land and solves that, that labor to the land problem. Because if you're not, you know, if you're there during the months of, you know, April and May and June and do the planting, you can't leave because you don't get paid until the crop is brought in. And only when the crop is brought in do you get paid. So this was a way to tie labor to the land. It was also, as you may be familiar by reading such great works as Let Us Now Pray, Praise Famous Men by James Agee, um, that it was a family-based system. Right? That sharecropping was a family-based system where the entire family was essentially put to work. One of the reasons it developed that way, economists will tell you, is that it solves the free rider problem and also the monitoring cost problem. That people are likely to work much harder and much more diligently 
if they are liter if, if failing to work will literally take food out of their children's mouths. Right? So this was a way to limit monitoring costs and limit free riding problems by making sure that this was a family-based operation where if I didn't work as a sharecropper, my kids would go hungry. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a very much, those of you who are parents, no, that's a very motivating uh, phenomenon. Those of you who aren't yet parents, you'll learn this at some point, some of you will. But anyway, sharecropping was not upset by this first wave of the Great Migration because the sharecroppers tended to be families. They were not single young men. The single young men were working as wage laborers, sometimes hired onto a farm to do particular tasks or a particular day or a set of hours, or they were working in, 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 in limited southern industry. They were the ones who moved north, but the sharecropping system stays the same right? after World War I. Okay. Get, get World War I, it cuts off the stream of, of European immigration, and for the first time ever, you see northern factories looking south, and they begin to pull some, northern, some, some southerners north, but those tend to be young single men. Right. Cause number two, the New Deal. Right. Now, are there any economists in the room? Whew, good. The dismal scientists, as we, call, as we call the economists, the dismal scientists in economics, they argue a lot about what caused the Great Depression and what cured the Great Depression. Right? As a political scientist, I care less about the ultimate truth of that. Because from a political perspective, the Keynesian dynamic, the Keynesian perspective won out. Right? We know who John Maynard Keynes was. Right? Born in 1883, died in 1946. He, he's, one of those, he's one of those guys that professors like me, we really like, right? Because almost every semester, right, you get some snotty-nosed freshman. Are there freshmen in the room? Right? I'm, you, you may or may not be snotty-nosed, right? But you get, you, get, you get freshmen coming up to you and they'll go, Professor, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich? Well, John Maynard Keynes was a professor. He was a don at, at, at Cambridge, and he was also rich. Right, made a fortune in the stock market. Right. He also married a ballerina. Right. He had that going for him as well. Right. Um, he is going to become famous right after World War I because he serves on the British delegation at the Treaty of Versailles negotiating the, the treaty that end, ends World War I. And he leaves that delegation because he thinks the, the world is making a huge mistake. And he writes a book that makes him famous in 1919 called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. <clears throat> Essentially, in 1919, he predicted there would be a second world war. And he was right. Makes him famous. Makes him a lot of money. His most important work, however, for my purposes here, is a book that he publishes in 1936 called The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And it's known to generations of economic students as the general theory. Keynes's view in the general theory is that the Great Depression was caused by overproduction and underconsumption. Right? Monetarists have a different view of this, but the Keynesian view that becomes sort of the, the, the textbook view of the Great Depression is that the Great Depression was caused by overproduction. Now that seems odd to us, right? It's like slavery being an, expense, an expensive form of labor. It seems odd to us that a time of great scarcity for individuals would be triggered by overproduction of goods. Right? How can that be? Do you know the Keynesian argument? If you're an indi individual producer of widgets, right? economists always talk about widgets. We don't even know what a widget is. It's just something, right? something that people want to buy. If you're, in a, if you're a firm producing widgets, and demand for widgets falls, so that the price of widgets starts going down, what's your incentive to do? No. Make more. That's, that's, that's the logic, right, of Keynesianism. That if you're getting paid less per individual widget, the only way you can make up for that is to make more widgets, 
But as more widgets get produced, price goes down. As the price goes down, as a widget maker, you, you make more. And as you make more, the price keeps going down, right? It becomes a vicious circle. Not a virtuous circle, but a vicious circle. Because what's individually rational for firms is not collectively rational for the economy. Because you've got a period of underconsumption and overproduction. Right? And that's going to lead to a situation where you have a glut of things on the market that there's no demand for, and that starts putting people out of business. You folks don't realize this, but probably here in, here in this part of South Carolina, you produce textiles here, right? I don't know this area too well. Right? But in the textile producing regions of North and South Carolina during the Great Depression, when there was no demand for textiles, the textiles were running 24 hours a day. They were running night shifts, producing more stuff that there was no market for because they thought the only way of climbing out of the low, of the, of the low demand was to produce more and sell more. Right? That's, that's the Keynesian argument, is that the Great Depression is going to be caused by underconsumption and overproduction. The Keynesian response to this was to turn classical economics on its head. Right? Classical economics had said, whenever you get into a depression or a recession, the best thing government can do is just to step back and do nothing. Right? That in the long run, the market is going to correct itself, and that anything government will do in the short run will simply make matters worse. What was Keynes' famous response to that? This is a line that young people in the room need to, need, need to remember. Right? And, and the older folks need to be reminded of. Keynes said, that may well be true, but in the long run, we're all dead. Right? I don't care about the long run if I'm not going to live long enough to see it. So Keynes argued that in the short run, government could and should try to increase demand and decrease supply. I promise you, I'm going to tie this right back to the Great, to, to the great Migration. Right? But it's just the intellectual art. I'll say, I'm going to make you smarter about this. Right. This was true, especially in the South. Right? Because in a very real way, the Great Depression was a regional phenomenon as much as it was anything else. The Great Depression hit the South hardest, harder than any other part of the country. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1938, says, it is, quote, my conviction that the South presents right now the nation's number one economic problem. Right. South was a problem. And it was a problem because you had overproduction and underconsumption. And Keynesian economic policies, which are going to get adopted by Franklin Roosevelt, and folks, I would tell you, by every president, Democrat, or Republican since, these Keynesian policies are going to be aimed largely at the South. One of them is the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. You guys know what the Fair Labor Standards Act is? Any, anybody here working for minimum wage right now? <laughs> Mr. Provost, did you see that? <laughs> Some of you students must be working for minimum wage, right? Yeah. Minimum wage was started with the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. It was originally, anyone know what the original minimum wage was per hour? What's it now? 7.35? There seems to be some disagreement about this, right? But it's somewhere between seven and eight dollars, let's say. It initially was set at 25 cents an hour to go up every year for three years in five cent increments to a grand total of 40 cents an hour. Right? That was a rate that was aimed entirely at the South because prevailing wages in the North were already above 25 cents an hour. Right? Now, I just throw that in. The real importance of the New Deal came in the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Right? First passed in 1933, originally declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, repassed in 1938. We can talk about why the court declared it unconstitutional. There's some interesting court dynamics here. But repassed in 1938. What does the Agricultural Adjustment Act do? 
not only sets limits on how much farmers can grow, it actually pays farmers not to grow crops. Right. This was a proposal that was first put forth by the kingfish. Who's the kingfish? Huey Long, right, from Louisiana. One of Franklin Roosevelt's premier challengers from the left, Huey Long says we should make 1933 a cotton-free year. We should burn the entire damn crop of cotton. Right, cotton holiday. Agricultural Adjustment Act doesn't go that far, but it was designed in 1933 to reduce the size of the American cotton crop by a quarter. And what it did was that it paid landowners who were supposed to distribute this money to their workers as well, supposed to, seven to twenty dollars per acre not to grow crops including cotton. Right. You probably should see where this is going, right? That is going to give landowners an incentive to begin clearing the land of sharecroppers and tenants. Right? If the government's going to pay you not to grow crops, why share that money with anybody else? Why not kick them off the land and take that $20 per acre just for your own self? Right? And this is going to begin the process of clearing the land of sharecroppers and tenants, and it's also going to lead to a real search for a me mechanical cotton um, harvester. Right? Apparently harvesting cotton is hard, right? much harder than harvesting wheat or corn. It requires more mechanical dexterity. And, and so the cotton harvester, mechanical harvester, was like the last of the big agricultural products to become mechanically harvested. But what that is going to do is that it's going to undo what Reconstruction did, which was to tie labor to the land. The, Fair La I'm sorry, the Agricultural Adjustment Act is going to sever the ties to the land, and it's going to make it so that whole families are now able to move, right? Because they're no longer going to be tied by these annual sharecropping contracts to the land. We need to also understand, right, that World War III is the third of these reasons, right? It's going to come right on the heels of the New Deal. And World War, I'm sorry, World War II is going to be important because the American economy is going to grow dramatically. Right? The size of the American economy triples. In 1941, America had a grand total of 40 tanks. I think, the, I think the armory in, in Columbia, Missouri that the, that, the, that the National Guard uses has more than 40 tanks today. America in 1940 had the 19th largest army in the world. Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia had a bigger army than we did. By the end of World War II, right, America is by far the largest military establishment in the world. And what's going to happen is that as America gears up its industrial might to fight eventually in World War II, you're going to see northern factories again begin to need labor that they can't get from other places. And again, they're going to turn to the south for that labor, and now you've got whole families who are able to move. Three plus million uh, southern, southerners are going to move north during World, during World War II, that is almost a quarter of the entire southern farm workforce is going to move during World War II. One of the other interesting aspects of World War II that's not directly related to the Great Migration, but, but, it, but it, 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 I think it's interesting, is that millions of southerners are also going to see the north, right? And they're going to see other countries. They're going to see different worlds out there. They're going to fight in, in Europe, and they're going to fight in Asia. And they are going to see places where race is not as important as it is in their home region of the South. And it's going to provide a wonderful opportunity for African American veterans to get education, leadership experience, leadership training. And they are going to begin to ask themselves, why are we fighting against race-based regimes in Hitler's Germany and Hirohito's Japan, only to be expected to go back right, to the South which has its own Jim Crow-based racial system and, be, and accept people who have been officers or, or non-commissioned officers being called boy again. Right? So what you see during, during World War II is, it's, is that African-American veterans develop something called the double V, right? victory in Europe or Japan first, and then we're going to come home and we're going to get victory in the South as well. 
Nota bene. Vice versa is also true, right? That millions of Yankees see the South. Right? And they see the South just as air conditioning is becoming available, right? Which is going to make the South a whole lot more uh, enjoyable, right? Um, the first air conditioning you might know was originally developed as for manufacturing. It was, to keep, it was to keep factories cooler for better manufacturing. The first public buildings to be air conditioned occur in 1929 and 1930, the U.S. Capitol and then the White House get air conditioned. And, and air conditioning is coming online more extensively during World War II. A lot of um, U.S. military veterans are going to spend some time in the South for an obvious reason because, yeah, why are they in the South? Why is the Band of Brothers training in Georgia, right? Don't make me fall off the stage, right? Don't make me lean forward so far that I fall. They're training in the South because, because you can train more of the year in the South, right? If you're, tra if you're training in Syracuse, New York, right, you're going to have to shut down all training, right, from late August. And uh, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, yeah. But you can, train, you can train essentially the entire year in the South, right? And you can't do that in, in, in a lot of the northern tier states. So a lot of military bases get built in the South because that's where training is easier during World War II. And so a lot of Yankees are going are to migrate through. They're going to spend some time in the South. They're going to be going, huh, I like it down here, right? I may move back. So you get a post-war consequences of World War II. You get a heightened awareness of regional conditions. And also you begin to get some of this reverse migration into the South. And one of the, one of the things that's going to help with that is a New Deal policy we didn't talk about, which is Social Security. Right? When you sever the tie between generations, right? when your children don't have to take care of you in your old age, when you have an income other than that, then you can start going, you know, Syracuse, New York in December is not, is not so nice, and maybe I'll move to Myrtle Beach or someplace, right? And, and that's going to happen as part of the reverse migration into the South. Anyway, three, three causes. World War I, Great, uh, Great Depression and, and the New Deal, and World War II, right? You see how those all fit together? I don't know how much time I've got. Good shape, right? Let's talk about the consequences of the Great Migration. They are many and varied, right? The Great Migration, as I say, is going to change the face of America. It's going to fa and it's going to change the face of the region. What it is essentially going to do is it's going to nationalize a regional racial issue. Right? I said before that the GOP didn't care about the South. They didn't even run candidates there. And the, and the National Democrats, they had to cater to the South because they had to get the, they had to get the, the two-thirds veto, overcome the two-thirds veto. Two-thirds veto dies in the 1936 Democratic National Convention, so that's no longer an issue. After FDR didn't need it, he got rid of it. The Great Migration is also going to do something important demographically, right? And if you think back to that map of, of the Great Migration, what you should have noticed was you get this transition of the African-American population that had been diffuse and rural and disfranchised in the North is going to be increasingly focused and concentrated, I'm sorry, diffuse and rural and disfranchised in the South is going to become increasingly urbanized and focused in the North. It's going to become concentrated, urban, and moving, African Americans are moving out of places where they are systematically denied the vote into places where they are more likely to be enfranchised and get the vote. It is just a simple fact of human existence that urban populations are easier to organize than rural populations. And you take an African American population that had been rural in the South and you make it urban in the North with the Great Migration. It is going to eventually make traditionally Republican states, New York, Illinois, People's Republic of, of Taxachusetts, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, the migration of African Americans North is going to, as they become Democrats, is going to make those states more competitive for the Democratic Party. Right? Prior to the Great Migration, Democrats rarely won statewide offices in those areas and could not carry the state 
for a, a, a Democratic presidential nominee. But with the Great Migration, now suddenly you shift, you shift the balance. Right? And these states are going to become competitive for the Democratic Party. It is also going to facilitate the creation of what are called MMD, minority, minority districts. And you're going to see the election of African Americans into Congress. The first of them, a man by the name of Oscar DePriest from Chicago, he's a Republican. He serves in Congress between 1929 and 1934. But he is a great example of the Great Depression, I'm sorry, the Great Migration, because he'd been born in Florence, Alabama, and moved with his family north, right, during, during, during the first wave of the Great Migration. The Great Migration is going to give national, especially national Democratic leaders, domestic political reasons to care about Southern African Americans, right? They, they didn't have these before because they, they didn't have to worry about, about, about African Americans. This is going to be in addition to the Cold War superpower and foreign policy reasons to care about African Americans. And this is something that's, going to, that's I think, again, is sort of under-realized. But as the hot war of World War II turns into the Cold War of the 1950s and 1960s, the battleground for, for in the Cold War is going to be places like Africa, Asia, Central America, South America, places where the native populations have skin colors that are not Caucasian. Right? And it was typical for, for, for Russians during this time period, for Soviets, to say, if you want to care, if you want to know what Americans really think about people like you with brown skin, just look at South Carolina, just look at Alabama, just look at Mississippi. And this becomes increasingly an embarrassment for U.S. national and international leaders who are trying to do this Cold War battle with the Soviet Union. Right? We know, for instance, that Ho Chi Minh, who was the leader of, of, of North Vietnam, he, he, would, he would kept this album full of clippings about lynchings in the South. Right? It is also going to prompt what my former, uh, former colleague and friend and, and Drew's dissertation advisor, John Petrachik, called an internal realignment within the political parties. That you are going to have African Americans becoming democratic, first in the northern states, and then, especially after 1960, in the southern states. And you are going to have southern whites becoming Republican. That as the, as the, as the Democratic Party increasingly embraces civil rights, which begins really in 1948, Harry Truman from Missouri, um, integrates the armed services, um, calls for uh, an, an end to, to segregation in things like federal contracting and the like. You get southern whites thinking, this is no longer my party. And so you see southern whites becoming Republican, as famously they do what Barry Goldwater said, we're going to go hunting where the ducks are. So th those are probably reasons you've already, uh, consequences you've already thought about. But there's some other consequences as well that you might not have thought about. The Great Migration is going to encourage interstate commerce. Why is that important? Well, for what is interstate commerce? Business that crosses state lines. Why is that important? It's regulated by the federal government. It's in the Constitution. Article 1, right, says that interstate commerce is regulated by the national federal government. And in a very famous case written by John Marshall, a decision written by John Marshall in 1819 called Gibbons versus Ogden, which was about the steamboat, right, steamboat uh, service between New York and New Jersey, John Marshall defines interstate commerce very broadly. If at any point, any part of the commerce crosses a state line. It is said that the stream of commerce crosses a state line, and that makes all of the commerce subject to federal regulation. Folks, I defy you to find me anything in this room, maybe anything on this campus, that has not crossed a state line at some point. Right? As, and before the Great Migration, you didn't get much of that, right? It was much closer. People didn't move much. right? After the Great Migration, a lot more movement of goods and people across state lines. That is going to be the legal basis for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that businesses that are engaged in interstate commerce are under federal law prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race or gender or religion, national origin, a whole bunch of other things. Right? And that is going to be upheld by the Supreme Court in the case of the Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States. But that really wouldn't have been an issue if there wasn't much interstate commerce. But since there is interstate commerce now on a grand scale, almost all parts of the economy are subject to the civil rights legislation. It is also going to dry up the pool of excess labor in the South. Right? I mentioned that those southern workers were available to go north because they were being underemployed and undervalued in the South. That's going to change with the Great Migration. It is, one of the aspects of that is that it's going to break down some of the old southern reliance on low wage labor. If you go back to 1900, the, nat the southern regional um, wage was only 52% of the national average. Now, wages are still lower in the south than in the rest of the country, but not nearly as low. As you see there, southern wages regionally are now 94% are now of the national average. And again, that is in large measure due to, to, to the Great Migration. As labor becomes scarcer in the South, its value goes up. And of course, that has contributed to the Sun Belt phenomenon, where you get, you can't produce high quality goods with low quality labor. So as you get, as you get Southern workers getting higher wages, they actually produce better goods. And that's why places like BMW have, have located in places like South Carolina. Conclusions. I know you're all waiting for this. What, when is he ever going to stop with this, right? I'm going to stop right here. Here's the last slide. The Great Migration gives you a new south and a new north, right? It is a more fully integrated country because of the Great Migration in a way that, that because of the Magnolia Curtain, you just didn't see before these three waves of the Great Migration. That is true economically, it is true politically, and it is true constitutionally. Um, we, we may have a long way to go, but the Great Migration has led to a fuller realization of the constitutional promise. Right? We are not a perfect union, but I think because of the Great Migration, we are a more perfect union than we were before. And that's a good constitutional theme to end on. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I bored you into a stupor, right? So, Fred. You're, you're talking to potentially a bunch of northerners. Sure. Sure. What about the. I got a great corned beef sandwich today for lunch, yeah, and you could not used to get that in South Carolina. Um, what about Natalie's sort of prospects of the reversion of that? Yeah. Um, not necessarily northern blacks in the south, but. There is, there is significant number of them. Yeah, for the Sun Belt phenomenon. Yeah, you absolutely see that. Um, that's sort of outside the scope of, the, of this project I'm working on, but you absolutely see it. And again, it goes back to that first point I made, that humans are, we're a transitory species. We move around a lot. So the only constant is going to be there's going to be change of some sort. And I think it has contributed to, I mean, it's, it's complicated. So I, I'm, I'm afraid of saying anything definitive about it because I can think of counter arguments to everything I was gonna, I'm, I'm going to say. Um, but it certainly has meant that the South is less distinctive than it used to be, right? Because you've seen this migration, both the Great Migration out and this reverse migration in, where you get states like Virginia and North Carolina that are likely to go vote for Clinton this year. Um, you get states like Florida, where you know, the further south you go, the, the further north you are in Florida. Um, it, it's part of this, you know, this, this grand experiment we're doing where people can, people can vote to move where they, they can move where they want to, and in some ways they're voting with their feet, right? And we can think about some of the reasons for that, social security being one, air conditioning being one. Um, so it's a multifaceted phenomenon, and I doubt if it's ever going to end. Right? That was not a very convincing answer to your question, Frederick. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yes? Mm-hmm. 
They are. Yeah. And how do they, how will that apply to that law? I don't know exactly, right? Um, but one of, the, one of the things about the American um, judicial system is someone's got to be harmed and someone's got to bring a lawsuit, right? So the federal courts, unlike state courts, they're not going to give advisory opinions. The Supreme Court is not going to say what you're doing is illegal until someone is harmed by it and c can show cause of action and can bring a suit. And that makes the federal courts reactive. It also means it could take a while before we, 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 see, we see any sort of federal resolution to this. But you're probably right that there probably is a federal cause of action under the, under, under the Interstate Commerce Clause. It's cocktail hour, right? I don't, I don't blame you for not having questions, right? Can we all go get a drink now? All right. Thank you very much for your time, folks. I certainly appreciate it.